I'm Richard, I collect vintage computers. I mainly collect 8-bit computers from the 1980s, but I've got a few other iconic pieces. Uh, last count, I think I had about 31, 32 computers, uh, but it's difficult to keep track. Um, I mainly collect 8-bit um, computers from the 1980s because I've got two requirements for something being in my collection. Either it's something that I wanted as I grew up as a teenager in the 1980s, um, or it's got to be iconic in some way, uh, groundbreaking in the computing industry. Um, today's video is about a computer that meets both of those criteria and I've been after for a very long time. So this thing that looks a bit like a portable sewing machine is an Osborne 1. And perhaps I should say that these are Osborne 1 computers because I've somehow managed to acquire two of them this year. Um, so I'll start by giving a little bit of a tour of these machines and then I'll go into a bit more detail about what I've been doing over the last month to try and restore the two of them to their former glory and a little bit beyond hopefully. The start of this one, it's a, it's a very nice little compact machine. Um, it's all fairly well sealed from the elements. Um, it's got a carry handle. It's got a um, section here for the power supply. Uh, the keyboard is in the base. And round the back you see the, um, the catches um, for the keyboard and this sliding uh, ventilation cover to give it ventilation when it's on. This one we've got laying down, it's missing the ventilation cover, um, but the keyboard um, folds down and unclips and is then connected by a nice um, uh, cable here. We've got a five inch cathode ray monitor, twin disk drives, um, storage slots for floppy disks, and a comprehensive array of ports. We've got like an external video uh, monitor socket, keyboard, parallel, serial, and a special serial port for connecting a modem that would go into um, one of those storage pockets. Oh, and there's also a connection over on the right for a lead acid battery pack that would apparently run for about an hour. Um, I've never actually seen anyone who's got one of those. Um, so this machine was introduced in uh, 1981. Um, these two particular models were built in 1982. Uh, there's a slight revision. Um, they changed the second revision. They changed the plastic case to be um, a more rugged plastic case. And they also put a more substantial keyboard cable on. The original one just had a ribbon connector. Um, informally, in the technical documentation, these are called the Osborne 1A, um, but they still just marketed it as the Osborne 1, because internally everything was more or less the same, except the very early first revision ones had single density disk drives, um, then they very quickly put a double density add-on card in them, and I believe all the 1A models um, were double density. I've never seen a um, first revision one in the UK. They're quite rare in the UK. They seem to be much more popular in the um, USA. So the main reason that I wanted this for my collection is it's well regarded as being the world's first portable computer. There just wasn't anything else portable in any fashion before this. Um, a year later, 1982, came the Epson HX20, which is generally regarded as the world's first laptop, because you could actually use it on your lap, uh, but it's very, very limited. Although it had a full travel keyboard, it's got a very limited LCD screen. It only had uh, cassettes, not discs, couldn't run proper business software. Whereas the Osborne was a full blown business machine. It runs CPM, um, 64k of RAM, twin disk drives, 180k disk drives um, on each, and full travel keyboard. So although it was a lot harder to lug it around, it could run proper business software. 
And indeed the big selling point was it came with a suite of business software. It came with WordStar and SuperCalc, word processor and spreadsheet, and some of the models came with DBase2 database. And CPM at the time was the um, the main business operating system. MS DOS was came out about the same time as the Osborne launched and hadn't got any traction yet. So CPM was what people used for business. Um, the IBM PC came along um, a very similar time and then cleaned up. But at the time, this was um, a serious business machine. So you could take it wherever you wanted to go and do proper business on it. Uh, which is why I lusted after it in the 80s, but could never um, afford one. Uh, when it came out, I would have been about 12 or 13 years old. Um, at the time, this sold for $1,800. Um, it was about £1,400, pounds in the UK. Um, and the similar other computers in the UK, home uh, microcomputers range from 100 to 400 pounds. So it was well outside the range that um, our family could afford. So this is an example of the software package that came shipped with the Osborne. One of their main marketing points was that the computer came with everything you needed and that if you'd bought all that software separately, it would cost you over $1,500. So effectively, you are getting this full portable machine for $250, $300 um, due to the power of the, uh, the deal, the bundle deal they did with the software manufacturers, which was a really smart move. So let's turn this machine on and see how it works. The cathode ray monitor takes a little while to warm up. And we come to the, the BIOS screen asking you to insert a floppy in the drive. So as common with all things, you don't use the original discs, you always make copies to boot from. So this is a CPM boot disc. By default, comes into some help information and then allows you to drop down into CPM. CPM is actually very similar to MS DOS because when MS DOS came along, CPM was the, the market leader and so they made it um, very, very similar to be useful for people to be able to switch over quite easily. So my adventures with the Osborne started with this machine on the right. That in February 2018, I managed to buy this on eBay. It wasn't fully working, but it was um, in an okay state. And I was reasonably optimistic that I might be able to get it fully working. Um, I tried throughout March to, um, to get it to boot, uh, failed. Um, but then found this other machine um, for sale on eBay that I was able to acquire. Um, and I figured with, um, with the extras that this machine had, I might be able to get both of them working. Um, April rolled round. Now in April, there is the Retro Challenge, which is an internet, very informal competition to do some cool stuff with old computers and blog about them. So I decided to document my Osborne restoration as part of this year's Retro Challenge. Um, the better condition machine I wasn't going to pick up until the second week of April. So I spent the first week of April blogging about what I'd already done with this machine um, while I waited for it to go and pick this one up. And then from the second week of April onwards, I blogged about what I did with this machine. Um, so I'll now um, go through bit by bit the, um, the process that I did um, with these two machines and if, hopefully if I've got time I'll cut in some photos of the, the work I did with them. So this first Osborne that I acquired wasn't in great shape, it's got a very yellowed case and you can see where there used to be stickers and it hasn't yellowed. Um, the catch on the power supply um, is broken. 
um, but otherwise it's not too bad uh, and it would boot up to the BIOS so the screen's working the CPU's working um, the character generator video board's working um, and if you try and boot up off the drive then the, the drive will go round but without any discs you just get a boot error and if you try and boot up the other drive that one works as well so my um, my initial thoughts were this machine will probably work um, it just needs some discs and I was reasonably optimistic that I might be able to do something of that because for last year's retro challenge I made this little machine which I called the Retromatic 2000 um, that amongst other things um, has a USB floppy drive emulator built in built on um, uh, HXC um, firmware on a GoTek floppy emulator and I'd seen some a couple of blog posts where people had managed to get HXC drives um, working with the Osborne so I was reasonably optimistic so I started off with the Osborne disassembled it um, I um, replaced the capacitors in the power supply uh, because one had already exploded uh, as tends to happen with power supplies of this age so I fixed that I cleaned up the floppy drives, cleaned the drive heads, uh, cleaned and lubricated the floppy drive rails um, and generally got it um, uh, all kind of ship shape. And I then wired up the special cable required uh, for the floppy drives because it has slightly non-standard floppy drive wiring. Connected it up to my Retro2, Retromatic 2000 device uh, with appropriate Osborne boot images, but couldn't get it to boot at all. Um, whatever I tried, I spent a couple of days trying lots and lots of different things, um, but came to the conclusion that it could be the drive controller, it could be um, the, the cabling, it could be the disk images, there could be so many different things that it could be. Then I saw this other Osborne come up on eBay and it had the boot disks included. So I figured if I can get that and then I can use the boot disks to boot off this, copy them, get that up and working and then I'll have two working machines. So that was the plan. So when I finally got hold of this second Osborne, I was really, really pleased with what I've got. It's in beautiful condition. It's barely yellowed at all. It comes with the original manuals, the original boot discs, which appear pretty much untouched, they're immaculate, which they should be because the previous owner had made copies of all the boot discs, which are for daily use, as you should. Um, and is generally in beautiful condition. As far as I can tell, this was being um, sold, it was originally owned by the father of the eBay seller, and I think we probably owned from new, um, and very, very much looked after. Um, the uh, other interesting thing about this is down here, you can see an extra um, Phono RCA Port. and this manual over here tells you suggests that it's got the screen pack add-on which is an extra video card that allows the um, driving um, the monitor at a higher resolution so normally this five inch monitor does 52 columns by I think 24 lines um, which isn't really enough for a lot of business software so they in, they implemented a virtual um, uh, screen system and you could use control and the arrow keys to move your virtual window around the actual screen. Um, but unless the software had been modified to work with 52 columns, um, that was a bit clunky. So what screen pack did was it um, doubled the horizontal resolution to 104 columns uh, and also gave a mode for 80 columns, which use the same size characters as 104, but just um, in the middle of the screen, but presumably for compatibility with 80 column software. Um, as you can imagine, 
um, that high resolution on that tiny monitor isn't great, but that's what this adds on here. So you see this um, thing say do not move while power is on. That's the external video port. And the reason it says do not remove is because uh, that plug actually connects the video signals back to the internal monitor. Um, and you pull that out and then it exposes the pins to connect an external monitor. Uh, but those do a separate video and sync signal which you need a custom monitor or custom wiring to get it to work. Whereas the screen pack board added on a composite video output with combined video and sync. So you could plug in a standard monitor, which I'll demonstrate in a bit. Uh, but with, by putting an external monitor on, it made the 80 column or the 104 column uh, display much more usable. So before I did anything else with this computer, I opened it up to check the power supply capacitors and everything else. The uh, capacitors looked in really good condition. They were deteriorating, but they're in the best condition I've seen of a power supply of this age, but I replaced them anyway. Uh, clean service the floppy drives, but it looked like they really didn't need it. Um, uh, so yeah, generally in very good condition. So uh, then I made a copy of the uh, CPM boot floppy, in this case onto an old MS-DOS disc. Um, so I could use copies rather than these original discs going forward. And that then would give me the chance to use a boot floppy on this old machine. Sadly, it still didn't work, so that was going to require more debugging. Also, while I had the um, newer Osborne opened up, I connected up my old Retromatic uh, USB floppy emulator onto the motherboard and found I could successfully boot up from the disk images that I'd previously tried to use on this machine unsuccessfully. So that meant there was nothing wrong with the disk images, there was nothing wrong with my USB emulator, there was nothing wrong with the cabling. Uh, so that would narrow it down considerably further. At this stage I'd got a working machine so I really wanted to play around with it as much as possible before tackling the old broken machine. So my next job was to try transferring files to it. Uh, I've got a whole load of CPM software I've downloaded off the net and I figured uh, RS-232 might be a good way to get software on it uh, because I didn't want to have to open up the case every time I wanted to plug in a floppy drive emulator. Um, so I dug out a trusty old Windows netbook, um, a USB to serial lead and through all my old leads, box of old serial leads. Um, I did a whole separate video about how to get this working, which I'll link in. Um, but the short answer is you need a modem lead, not a null modem lead to connect up to the RCH V2 25 pin serial port. Um, I can use PIP to transfer software. Um, you've got to pick the right device you've got in cpm you've got virtual devices and physical devices and unless you run the right setup software you haven't assigned the correct virtual device to the physical device um, from memory i think it was ptr paper tape reader was the physical device that would read from the serial port and successfully do transfers uh, I later found out inside the Osborne on the motherboard is a jumper that allows you to select a higher speed um, serial. So instead of 300, 1200 board switchable, it doubles it to 600, um, 2400 board, which I've also successfully tested. So the next thing I wanted to test was the high resolution output from the screen pack board and also external video monitors. Um, so here I've got a studio monitor plugged in. So this makes it a whole lot more usable. Um, the 52 columns is a bit chunky on this, I think, 14 inch monitor. But interestingly, you'll see that the video is cut off around the edges. That's because um, Osborne were in charge, they use their own internal monitor or a very specific Osborne branded monitor on this video output. So they were in complete control of it and they used the entire height of the video signal to get the maximum number of pixels in. 
but um, most monitors have overscan, which cuts off the edge. Thankfully, this is a studio monitor, so I've got an underscan setting, which allows me to see the entire video signal. But any other computer monitor, um, that's a bit more problematic. So you've got to be quite careful about picking the monitor that you use with this. The external monitor shows quite well the, um, the dim characters that um, the Osborne is capable of doing. Uh, quite bizarrely, it has a 9-bit video memory. Um, it uses 7-bit um, ASCII characters, but then it uses an 8-bit to specify underlining so that any character can be, can be underlined and uses a ninth bit um, to specify dim characters. These are only in the video memory um, that it, uh, you only use seven bit ASCII characters but there are control codes that will turn on and off underlining and turn on and off the dim characters. So to use the high resolution modes um, Osborne provided with the screen pack um, card uh, extra utility disc with a different version of the CPM setup program which then allows you as well as changing the logical screen size which is standard um, setup program to do you can change the physical one so we can go for 80 here and let's just change that in memory rather than on the boot disk. And now we get a um, 80 column output, which you can also see on the little the internal monitor, but it's really, um, it's barely readable. It's, it's really hard to read on there. Um, and we can then also go to 104 character mode. which in fact uses exactly the same size characters as the 80 column mode, uh, it's just shifted over to the left. So the 80 column mode just seems to be um, used as 104 character mode, but just uses a center cutout down the middle to restrict it to 80 columns uh, for compatibility with other CPM software. And again, um, it, 104 mode, character mode fills the internal screen, but it's really not very usable. My next day's work was to fix this keyboard, which this up arrow key here, uh, the plunger underneath the shaft had broken off. Um, there's not much to show you now because I've done a okay job of repairing it. Um, I re-glued the plunger, let it um, dry for 48 hours to get the maximum strength and reassembled it. Um, you can see there's it's very slightly wonky because it was very hard to get the shaft, broken off shaft, aligned. Um, but it seems to be working okay. So hopefully that will give a few more years use to come. So I now returned to the broken Osborne to see if I could figure out what was going on with the floppy drive. Um, the, my big suspicion was with this chip, the floppy disk controller on it, because from inspection, um, the, it seemed to have had broken pins that had been soldered back on and soldered into an a, a additional socket. And given that everything was working apart from the floppy drive, I figured that was the first thing to replace. And I managed to get one of these quite cheaply off eBay for about five pounds. I thought that's worth a try. When I came to install it, I noticed some, there was a jumper that was missing right next to the controller chip on the motherboard that was present in the working Osborne. So I tried replacing that, um, which changed the symptoms and it got a lot further in booting up, but was still giving me sector errors. Um, I tried swapping out the motherboard between the two machines and the motherboard from the good Osborne um, connected up to the, the non-working Osborne worked perfectly, which means it was something on the motherboard. The two drives, the power supply, the monitor um, on the broken Osborne were all okay. And it wasn't the controller chip. Um, 
um, which means it's probably some of the glue logic chips. There's um, some various NAND gates um, and counter chips, and there's um, uh, what is it called a PIA um, to interface between the floppy disk controller and the ZATCPU. So I suspect it's probably something there. Although it is possible it could be bad RAM because presumably. The sectors on the floppy have to be buffered in RAM before the CPU can use it. So if there's a RAM fault in one of the chips, then maybe that could give me corrupt sectors when you boot up. Um, all in all, it needs more investigation, but I really need better test tools than I've currently got. Um, so that's something I'm working on trying to get, uh, and then hopefully I can get that um, other old Osborne working again but for now that has to be put aside and we'll concentrate on the one that does work. So my next task was to try and get some software onto the Osborne. I'd already tested RS232 serial transfers which would be good for getting the odd uh, bit of software on uh, but it's slow and laborious and since I'd already managed to use the uh, Retromatic 2000 floppy emulator um, to um, to boot, I reckoned I could um, bulk transfer disk images and copy them onto floppy, um, and then use RS232 for occasional stuff because um, to transfer stuff via the floppy emulator, I'd have to open up the case to connect cables. So that's what I was going to try and do. Sadly, um, I couldn't do that because um, one thing I'd forgotten from when I did my initial tests is that this floppy emulator, uh, the drive select line, uh, which selects between the A and B drive from the Osborne wasn't getting through correctly. And I'd had to hack it to make the, um, the emulator um, respond to any drive uh, in order to get it to work. But that meant I couldn't copy between A and B drive um, because this would respond to um, when you try to write to the floppy, physical floppy, this would respond as well. I spent several days trying to debug it, um, still didn't manage to get to the bottom of it. Uh, what's inside here, a lot, lots, of other, lots of other stuff, is a GoTech USB floppy emulator with HXC firmware, which is a superb bit of software uh, written to uh, allow the GoTech to emulate Shugart standard floppies. Um, but I've also done lots of hacking around with this, as you can see from all these wires, to add extra functionality. So it could be one of my mods was um, was interfering with the drive select line. Um, it could be I've got faulty hardware there. Thankfully, I had another option um, because um, I'd heard about an alternative firmware that you can put on GoTech called Flash Floppy um, that I wanted to try out. And so I'd ordered another GoTech um, drive in order to try that out on because I didn't want to mess with this one once I got it working. And that arrived while I was working on the Osborne. So I had a go at installing Flash Floppy firmware and to cut a long story short, I got it working um, successfully with the Osborne. The drive select line was getting through okay, so I'm still not sure what, what was faulty here, and I will investigate that later. Um, once I got the, um, the new GoTech drive working with the Osborne, I managed to figure out the way that I could permanently or semi-permanently mount it in the Osborne case. Uh, which is what you might have noticed here already. Um, this is actually just a friction fit in the in this floppy storage bay with some ribbon cables at the back. Uh, the GoTech drive didn't fit in its plastic case, so I've taken the top of the case off and replaced it with cardboard covered with electrical tape for neatness, so it will fit in this slot. I've also put an OLED. Uh, screen in here and I've added a switch here that allows me to um, select whether I'm using the internal or the virtual drive. So if it's up it selects the B drive alongside the A drive. If it's down then it will power on the, um, the drive emulator and it also activates a relay that intercepts the B drive drive select line and routes it to here. So that means that this then acts as a B drive alongside the physical A drive. So now I should be able to do uh, a directory on the B drive and then all that 
access the um, uh, the um, drive emulator instead. Um, also, the Osborne allows you to swap the drives by typing double quote instead of return to boot, and that means this will then behave as an A drive and allow you to boot. Uh, and this one becomes the the physical drive over here becomes the B drive to, um, to the drive emulator. So now I've got a semi-permanent solution that means I can just remove this uh, this memory stick. Um, and um, put software on there and get it loaded onto the Osborne. And I can also copy from here onto physical floppies. Um, and so this can be turned off. I've then got A, a and B drives just as it was originally made um, without sort of touching the new technology, which is quite a nice solution. So now I've managed to find a way to get files via the um, USB floppy emulator onto the Osborne was it was time for the final task of my challenge uh, that I'd set myself, which was to get some text adventure games running under CPM on the Osborne. In particular, some of the Infocom games such as Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, this proved to be quite convoluted, as this little diagram shows, that the floppy drive emulator um, reads from a USB, needs disk images in a format called HFE um, to edit CPM disk images to access individual files I needed to use a tool called CPM tools that could only use raw image disk images um, so I had to find a number of tools that would convert between um, these images and the HFC images via an intermediate format um, and I've written a whole load of shell scripts that will make that an awful lot easier that's all on the blog but it meant I could put individual CPM um, games onto a USB stick and be uh, able to be run by the Osborne. Um, so I can boot from this Hitchhiker's disk image, for instance, um, and then we have a number of files. I'll go onto the external monitor. Um, I also spent a while um, manipulating the binaries of the files in order to get the Infocom game interpreter to, to work well on the Osborne um, because you need to um, uh, set it up to use the particular graphic control codes that the Osborne has um, to get the screen layout correct. Um, you can also set it up for a different number of columns for the word wrapping um, and what game files are going to be loaded. So I made these generic uh, files that will load in something called game.dat, which in this on this disk image is a hitchhiker's game, and then all the .com files called game something or other um, will load in that game file. So I've got different ones for 52 columns, 80 columns and 104 columns and with graphics characters or non-graphics characters. So if I run game 52J for instance, then that will load up Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on 52 column mode, which is suitable for the internal monitor. Um, with a nice status line at the top by using the control codes. Alternatively, if I wanted to run in 80 column mode on the external monitor, I can set my logical screen to 80 and I can set my physical screen to 80. Save that in memory. And then if I run game 80G, that will load up hitchhikers in 80 column mode with the graphics that will work well on an external monitor. And now I can play possibly my favourite ever text adventure on a genuine vintage CPM machine from 1982, which makes me exceedingly happy indeed. So that pretty much concludes uh, my retro challenge for April 2018. Um, let's just recap, let's go back to my original challenge that I set myself. Um, I said that my goals for the retro challenge were refurbish the second Osborne 1, recap the power supply unit, service the disk drive and get it booting. Check. Example here. 
Two, try to get make new boot discs for the first Osborne one and get it booting. I can then hopefully pass it on to another collector. Well, I've made boot discs, but it does. That's not all it needs. I have though managed to um, prove that everything is working apart from um, some of the floppy logic on the motherboard. Uh, so I hope that I may be able to fix that in the future if I get the right diagnostic tools. Number three, find a way to get internet downloaded software onto the Osborne, possibly using a USB floppy drive emulator, check, or possibly using a serial port, also check. Uh, and conclude by playing a classic CPM game on my portable computer, preferably Colossal Cage Adventure or The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Very much check. So yeah, I'm very, very happy with what I've managed to achieve this April. I'm very, very happy with my Osborne. I've always wanted one ever since I was a teenager, and now I finally do. Thank you for watching this rather long video. Um, and more details are on my blog. I'll link that in the description. Thanks.